The Parthenon has come to represent the closest approach to the ideal proportions of a classical temple. In other words, we've placed it on a pedestal. This must be partly due to the fact that it's located on an actual pedestal, the prominent steep-sided rocky hill of the Acropolis. It's also a temple that's built on a grand scale, but with great precision, using the beautiful locally available white pentelic marble. A temple would in fact only need to be reasonably well proportioned to inspire awe when being made on such a large scale in such a great location using such a beautiful stone. The Parthenon is also a product of a culture that we value because it gave us democracy, artistic excellence, history, theatre, comedy, philosophy and all the rest of it and so has come to stand for those things, which no doubt adds to the high esteem in which we hold it. But how can we square this image of the Parthenon with the jingoistic and combative egotism of the messages it displays in the reliefs that adorned it? The war of the gods against the giants, of the demigods and heroes against the centaurs, of the Greeks against the Trojans, and of the Athenians themselves against the Amazons. That's a lot of war. And how do we square that image of the culture it stands for with some of the dubious decisions made by the Athenian democracy? For example, the way they turned the Delian League into a protection racket. We seek to solve this problem by looking to form over content and returning to the notion of harmonious proportion. As such, we find ourselves still able to see the temple as representing a culture that had been through many struggles, many battles, but which had decided, in spite of all that ugliness, or as a reaction against it, to turn its attention to the eternal forms of platonic beauty, triumphing above all that ugliness. So now, as it looked at its own mythic past, it transformed struggle into narrative, narrative into poetry, poetry into art, violence into beauty. This is a generous interpretation and may be partly a myth, but there's nothing wrong with a myth if you know it's a myth. You can value something for what it's come to represent without necessarily agreeing with the set of values from which it was born, if you're aware of the distinction. You can embrace the resonance of the tradition without embracing values you don't believe in. But is it entirely a myth that the Parthenon's beauty is derived from proportions that were based on a coherent, integrated, transcendent mathematical system which connected the part to the whole? Did the architects, Ictinus and Callicrates, base the measurements only on a general feel for what looked right without a logical system? Or is there some truth in the myth? It would be nice if it wasn't entirely a fiction. Attempts to find the golden ratio in the design have been somewhat unconvincing, but there is another option that's more compelling, namely to look at the design as being derived from Pythagorean triangles. The pediment is, of course, an isosceles triangle. The slope angle of the pediment of the Parthenon corresponds to that of a particular Pythagorean triangle. Pythagorean triangle is a right-angled triangle where all three sides are in whole number ratio. The most well-known example being, of course, the 3-4-5 triangle. In the case of the Parthenon, the slope angle of the pediment corresponds to the 9-40-41 triangle. So let's explore a different hypothesis, that one of the governing principles was that the pediment's angle of slope should come from a Pythagorean triangle. This triangle then also governs the distance between the columns in a simple way, because this intercolumnar distance is equal to the height of the pediment, that nine unit distance. So this can be seen as another of the governing principles of the design, and it tells you how many columns you'll have by dividing the width of the governing pediment right angle triangle by its height. In such a system, if you had decided you wanted a six pillar facade, you could pick a Pythagorean triangle where the height divided into the width three times, giving three to each side, adding up to six. So you could use the 7, 24, 25 Pythagorean triangle as seven divides into 24 three times, remainder three. But if, as with the Parthenon, you had decided on an eight pillar facade, you would be looking for a Pythagorean triangle where the height divides into the width four times, 
and this is why you could choose the 9 40 41 triangle. 9 divides into 40 four times, remainder 4. The two outer columns are brought in a bit so they sit more soundly under the entablature. This is known as column contraction. I should point out that the temple shown here is my own design for a Parthenesque eight pillar Doric temple, but with that design based very heavily on measurements, diagrams and drawings of the Parthenon. The pediment triangle is truncated and this harmonizes with structural concerns because without the truncation, the thin overhanging wedge of the triangle would be a weak part of the structure. The Roman architect Vitruvius, who claimed to have seen writings by Ictinus, the Parthenon's designer, wrote that the triglyphs of a temple should be based on the key modular distance of the overall design. And sure enough, the width of the triglyph meto pairs of the entablature here come from this same height distance of the pediment triangle, with two triglyphs in each intercolumnar distance. And the width of this entablature below the pediment is seven times nine rather than eight times nine because we lose one overhanging triglyph, one half intercolumnar distance in other words, on each side. Again, for structural soundness. But before we look at more of the detail, we can next see how the pediment triangle governs the proportions of the whole. If we add back in the part of the triangle that was lost in truncation, we can now see how the height of the temple is such that the whole of the facade, including the invisible truncated part of the pediment triangle, is contained within a simple two by one rectangle, or one square reflected to make a double square. Pythagoras' theory of right angled triangles is of course all about squares. The square on the short side plus the square on the medium side equals the square on the hypotenuse. What we have in each of the squares making up the double square here is one of those very squares, the square on the medium side of the governing pediment triangle. What about the third dimension, the length? The Parthenon has 17 columns along the side with 16 intercolumnar distances whereas the front, as we have said, has seven intercolumnar distances above its eight columns. However, if we needed to add the truncated part of the pediment triangle back in, in order to see the enclosing double square of the facade, then it makes sense that we would also add back in the two half intercolumnar distances that were dropped for structural reasons from the entablature of the facade. After all, the height of the pediment divides into the width of the whole pediment eight times. That was our starting point. And that width wasn't made entirely invisible. It is still present at the base. So with the two ends of the temple returned to the full eight intercolumnar distances by including the invisible parts of the design plan, this gives us an eight to 16 ratio of the, of the widths of the ends to the width of the side of the temple. And eight to 16 is actually the one to two ratio. So this gives us, again, a two by one rectangle, a double square. So just to reiterate, in the case of the height and width dimensions of the facade as a whole, and the case of the length and width dimensions of the entablature as a whole, when we add back in the parts that were made invisible for structural reasons, we get the double square. The nature of the design here is that the height from the base to the line dividing the entablature is three intercolumnar distances, while the width of the base from the center is four intercolumnar distances, so this delineates the simplest Pythagorean triangle of three, four, five. If we move this triangle up to the floor level of the temple, the top of the 345 now touches the bottom slab of the pediment. Now we can look at the columns. Measurements have confirmed that to a high degree of accuracy, the width of the columns compared to the distance between the axes of the columns is in the ratio of four to nine, which certainly seems to confirm that nine is the key modular number of the design 
uh, governing this distance between the axes, the interaxial or intercolumnar distance. It also means the width of the columns compared to the empty space between them is in the ratio of 4 to 5, which we can see as a Pythagorean ratio, again from the 3, 4, 5 triangle. So just as in Platonic philosophy, the things in the world are teleologically drawn up towards the governing form of their platonic idea via a top-down principle rather than just clumping together randomly from the smallest parts. In this design, the triangle of the gods up on the heights, literally as the pediments were, were where the reliefs of the Olympian gods, the archetypes, resided in Greek temples, this triangle governs the overall design. Yes, it's a modular design, but the module is arrived at from the overarching pediment triangle rather than the other way around. In Platonic philosophy, an organism is primarily an organism. The idea is primary, has its own objective existence in the realm of mind, and the constituent parts in the world are subordinate to that. Some degree of Platonism of this type is part of a sane way of looking at the world. When you look at a rabbit, you see a rabbit rather than just a bunch of limbs that happen to be joined together, with those limbs in turn not being limbs but clumps of other smaller parts. Some degree of top-down platonic organistic perception is essential if you don't want to drown in a sea of component parts. As such, a platonist outlook is a healthy counterpart to the useful but less psychologically sound reductionist approach of the scientific method. Returning to our modern myth of the Parthenon then, is there some truth in it after all? If the hypothesis here is correct, then yes, there is truth in the notion that the proportions were arrived at through a system of logical principles linking part to whole, a system that went beyond mere practical requirements and started from eternal mathematical truths. It's surely not true that the resulting proportions are inherently better than those that would be arrived at from all other such systems, but we can perhaps say that the presence of this system helps, along with other such factors such as location, scale, materials, precision and exceptional craftsmanship, to account for the uniquely high estimation in which this temple's design has been held. So, the Parthenon isn't the archetypal model for a well-proportioned temple. Such an archetype can only exist as an essence in the realm of ideas. The Parthenon is just one example of a classical temple, albeit a good one with lessons to teach. And that's surely how it should be. A downside of a Platonic outlook, if taken too far, could be a tendency to focus only on the universal and not on the particular. But preciousness is often found at the intersection of the two, where something is both a good example and a unique example of its type.